Well, it's an honor to speak about Kate today with Sam and Amelia and Jenny. I, I want to give some perspective on uh, Kate's work at the Church History Department. I began work at the Church History Department in late 2010, and my position was called the Director of the Publications Division, and mostly the Publications Division was the Joseph Smith Papers, and then three or four other people that didn't really fit. And one of those people was Jill Durr, who was, it was an amazing historian of Latter-day Saint women's history. But within a few months, she said, she told me she was going to retire. But she hoped that we could find someone to really take up that mantle of writing Latter-day Saint women's history. And as we talked with several excellent candidates, it was clear that Kate was the right person. She had the right academic skills from BYU and Harvard and Boston. But she had a vision for the importance of highlighting women's voices, for the ways that that can help build faith in the gospel. And it was clear that she would be a builder. We didn't just want a lone scholar. We wanted someone who could build something. It was also clear that she'd have the right personality to navigate what can be a unique culture at church headquarters. And that she'd be able to speak with clarity and authority to scholars and academics, but also be able to speak with clarity and authority to church leaders and church employees. So we were thrilled when Kate accepted a position in 2011. And that's our little internal news uh, that we sent out. For the next several years in our organizational structure, Kate reported to me. I always considered her a mentor, though, and she truly was. And we collaborated on many projects. The first assignment we got, and I think Kate got this assignment like the first week she was there, was to help finish this book, The First 50 Years of Relief Society. It had begun by Jill Durr and Carol Cornwall Madsen, both now retired. And the project had begun many years earlier to publish a single document, the Nauvoo Relief Society Minutes, which contained really important information about the ties, about women's authority in the church, about the ties between the Relief Society and the temple. They contained Joseph Smith's sermons uh, to the women of the church. There had been some hesitation over the years to publish this document, and Jill and Carol had decided to publish it in a much longer collection of documents that would trace the Relief Society and the discussions about all of those topics in the 19th century. So a lot had been done on the book, but a lot remained. Neither Kate nor I had much experience in documentary editing or 19th century Latter-day Saint women's history. So we both learned from the documentary historians of the Joe Smith papers and from Jill's. We wrote footnotes and introductions. One of Kate's core impulses is to integrate diverse voices, to include diverse voices. And so when we began, there was an, a lot of diversity in, in those documents. But she researched and found a document from an American Indian Relief Society, this document. So we can include it along with many documents from largely white relief societies. And throughout her career, Kate advocated for history that took seriously indigenous women and African-American women and women in Bolivia and Brazil and Botswana. And on first 50 years and other projects, she took seriously the lived religion of people. She, she wanted, she cared about how religion was actually practiced for people's daily experiences. And I think you see that in her love of the history of food. Taking something like the history of food seriously was one way that Kate took seriously the daily lives of women. So maybe next slide. The, the publication of First 50 Years was a landmark event. This is a, a picture in, 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 in the Relief Society building with, with those great uh, past Relief Society leaders in the background. And it was an indication that women's history needed to be taken as seriously, the same sort of scrutiny as other parts of Latter-day Saint history like the Joseph Smith uh, papers. Um, maybe the next slide. So another case early document, Sam's already talked about this, was this uh, book, Women in Mormonism, which came out of a conference at the University of Utah. Uh, and I think the important thing about this is 
if you look at the list of contributors, it tells you something about how Kate, Kate's networks and how she thought about people and this impulse for inclusion. So there's leading scholars of American religion, there's younger scholars, Latter-day Saints, non-Latter-day Saints, political scientists, therapists, women in Europe and Sierra Leone and New Zealand. She knew that the study of Latter-day Saint women needed all those perspectives. And Kate's personality and credibility allowed her to assemble um, such a great collection. So when Kate began work at the Church History Department replacing Jill, she was our, our only specialist in women's history. And we asked her to envision how we could do more, how we could raise awareness within our department. And she did a number of things that we still do every year. Uh, she began a women's history luncheon that we do at the Relief Society birthday every year. Uh, it, we, it includes all of our staff along with church leaders. And past speakers have included uh, panels of all the past young women general presidents, all the past primary general presidents, as well as uh, people like Rosette bah Bahadi, who was a, a Relief Society president of the Sw Swahili branch in Salt Lake. Um, second, she brought in a yearly outside scholar, someone who studied the religion of Catholic women or Jewish women to, to, to add to our perspectives. And she also organized a yearly event for our department staff to present research on women's history. But maybe even more fundamental than that, Kate looked for every opportunity, every position that came open, maybe not every, but a lot to say, isn't it time we add one more historian of Latter-day Saint women's history? And we have a lot more now than we did when we hired Kate. And that is a lot because of her advocacy, her excellence. Um, Kate's next major project was to edit this book, Out the Pulpit, which Sam has referred to as sort of female journal of discourses. And I, and I think one thing about this book, that about Kate's career is, she was often working with people in other church departments. She was on lots of committees. And we put her on a committee with the Sunday school curriculum writers or the seminaries and institute writers. And she, she always was such an advocate for including women's voices in lessons and talks. And this is an example uh, of that, a way to make women's sermons more accessible. And not only more accessible in English, but in other languages than as it's translated, which allows um, people who prepare Sunday curriculum or Seminary's Institute curriculum to, to easily integrate that in. So there, there, there was sort of a deeper strategy at play uh, there. Um, after that book, um, she's uh, led a team um, to write a history of the Young Women's Association organization. Not much research had been done meaning that this project demanded intense archival research, new oral history interviews. Kate made clear from the beginning that the history of the young women needed to be a global history, uh, happening both at church headquarters and around the world. She knew that each generation of church leaders and members has to tackle the problem anew of how you help youth gain their own testimonies in the church of Jesus Christ, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each generation has felt intense anxiety as new social and cultural currents have threatened traditional values. Each generation has had to innovate using resources from the past as well as new directions. And the story of this book is a story of how the church has navigated these challenges through the generations. So this is an awesome book, but it won't be Kate's last. Um, this will be published in, in, in a few years, in 2025. One of Kate's great gifts is to draw people to her, to draw people to those topics of importance to her. We've already heard about how she's a mentor. Um, there was a session at the Mormon History Association this last summer uh, considering Kate's legacy, and there were 50 or 60 people there, and a few, of us, a few of us said a few things. And then it turned into a type of testimony meeting where person after person told how Kate had mattered to them, how she had mentored, and reached out to them. That's not typically what happens at a scholarly conference. In 2018, this picture, um, well, let me mention one thing. After a few years in the department, um, Kate and I had a conversation where Kate said, you know, 
I'd like to manage people. I want to be a people manager. I want to help direct the work of others. And she took it so seriously. She read books about leadership. She talked with more experienced managers. And in, the, in our councils in the church history department, her wisdom and perspective consistently helped us make better decisions. And because of Kate's mentoring, we're in such a better place now than we were 12 years ago to tell these stories. In 2018, as we completed Saints Volume 1, a group of us suggested to our colleagues within the church that perhaps a broadcast would be appropriate. Elder Quentin Cook was our advisor in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and he was assigned to lead the broadcast. He asked if I would participate and asked that a female historian also participate. Someone with presence, someone with credibility, someone with faith. As we discuss possibilities, Elder Cook asked that Kate be that person. The assignment was daunting. We'd be tasked with answering many of the challenging questions about church history, plural marriage, Book of Mormon translation, First Vision accounts, on a live stage with a worldwide audience in the hundreds of thousands. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I was nervous, but the people in the correlation department were even more nervous. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we, pre we prepared for months. In the weeks before the event, I think that both Kate and I, and likely Elder Cook, felt tremendous stress. Kate and Sam, and Lucy, and Amelia, and Persephone, and Alyssa and I, and uh, our four, Caleb and Elsie, and Keegan and Enoch, went back to Nauvoo a, a day or two early to see the sights. The night before the event, I rehearsed what I might possibly say about a possible question with Alyssa. It wasn't going well, my tongue was tied, my anxiety was high, and both Alyssa and I were pretty worried about what was going to happen. <laughs> and Kate later told me that she was experiencing much the same. But we shared a memorable and sacred, uh, sacred experience for us. We both felt we received help from heaven as the lights went on, the sun descended on a beautiful night in front of the Nauvoo temple. Kate was sensational. She has a stage presence. People trust her. If the social media commentary afterwards can be, can be believed, she was the star. People liked Elder Cook. They recognized that there was some other historian there. <laughs> but they loved Kate. For years, people have asked me, have I seen you somewhere? <laughs> Wait, were you on a broadcast with Kate Holbrook? <laughs> and of course, Kate did all that in the very advanced stages of cancer. I'm in awe of what she accomplished, notwithstanding her health challenges. So one of Kate's great gifts is to see bridges where others see divides. In her last 18 months with the department, she was our academic outreach coordinator, building bridges and relationships with scholars. I think this gift to see and build bridges is particularly evident in both things are true. After reading the book, I wrote this description. For a disciple scholar like Kate Holbrook, speaking in the language of faith is essential. And speaking in the language of scholarship is essential. Both things are true, even if few people master both skills. Kate has both gifts in abundance. I can only write of Kate in the present tense because she still teaches on both sides of the veil. Her mind integrates while so many others divide. Teaching that principles that are apparently contradictory are both true, the spiritual and the intellectual, forgiving and remembering, humility and legacy, the life of the disciple and the life of housework. She wrestles with big questions. What does it mean to say the church is true? How does revelation come? With beautiful, accessible language, language, with vulnerable personal examples, with examples from scripture, early church history, and modern saints from Rwanda to Russia, Kate shares her wise, empathetic voice. Most of all, these essays that she wrote while facing her own mortality share her voice of faith, a faith in Jesus Christ, a faith in the church she loves, a faith in the stories of the past to teach, warn, and inspire. A faith in people struggling through their own mortal experiences. 
in the decade that we worked together at the church audience, at church history department, we often spoke about the two audiences that we need to, that we wanted to reach. One was an audience of Latter-day Saints around the world who want to hear stories of faith, who sometimes struggle with questions of faith and history, who want to feel a part of a broader narrative of God's people. And the audience of scholars who want to examine our sources, who want to understand how, to, how we fit in broader narratives and scholarly frameworks. We exist in both worlds. We have to be bilingual. But most of us are better at speaking to one audience or the other. Some have gifts to speak to both worlds, to both audiences, and to do so with complete integrity. And that was Kate.